Hello and welcome to Roundtable. How strong are the forces of corruption in the European Union's poorest nation, Bulgaria? People there will vote this weekend and have the chance to put the country on a cleaner, more prosperous path. The former Prime Minister Boyko Borisov was once said by a US ambassador to Bulgaria to be implicated in serious criminal activity. He may not be in office anymore, but how much power does he still have? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Allegations of corruption in Bulgaria's ruling elite aren't new, but claims that European Union funds are being embezzled and that there's been political wiretapping have led to street protests. The United States has imposed sanctions. Can Bulgaria put all this behind it? Allegations of corruption have dogged Bulgaria for years. The country is ranked as the most corrupt country in the European Union by Transparency International. And poverty is widespread too. In 2019, 32.5% were marked at risk of poverty or social exclusion, according to Eurostat. After a series of scandals and a deteriorating health and economic crisis, mass protests erupted against the government in July of last year and have continued. This summer, the US government placed sweeping anti-corruption sanctions on high-profile Bulgarian power breakers and more than 60 entities. The European Union has also criticised Bulgaria over its failure to uphold the rule of law and judicial independence. But it has come under serious criticism itself for failing to intervene, particularly when European Union funds allegedly end up in the hands of Bulgaria's mafia and powerful oligarchs. So will the upcoming parliamentary election be a watershed moment for the fight against corruption there? Well, let's first of all go to the Bulgarian capital, Sofia, and there we see Genoveva Petrova, Bulgarian sociologist and executive director of Alpha Research. And then to Poland, where we meet Spasimir Tomradzki, Visegrad Insight Fellow, who's from the University of Warsaw. And then we go to Sicily, and we say hello to Veronica Ankel, political scientist at the European University Institute. Very good to have all of you uh, with us here on Roundtable. I want to keep the pictures of all three of you up on the screen and ask you a question to which you need not necessarily utter any words. And that is, I'm pretty sure none of you would want Boyko Borisov as an enemy. Would any of you want him as a friend? Well, uh... Actually, it's not about uh, per perceiving him as enemy or friend. Uh, actually, the figure of prime minister is a kind of institutional figure. And uh, most of Bulgarians, including me, would like to be, let's say, in a good relations with the institutional representatives. OK, but he's described as a pretty unpleasant fellow by... Let's look at the, um, these quotations from two former US ambassadors. First, John Bale. He was ambassador there in 2005. This is from WikiLeaks, a diplomatic cable. Uh, Borisov, unbridled political ambition, implicated in serious criminal activity, close ties to Lukoil, that's a massive oil and gas company, uh, one of the top 100 in the world in terms of... Uh, trade and the Russian embassy. And then we have Nancy Meckel Downey, a little bit later, US ambassador to Bulgaria. Cunning, tainted past, charismatic, wild card, personal ties to 1990s mafia leaders. Back to you, Genoveva. Would you rather have somebody who didn't that, have that kind of past in the prime minister's office? We have to know that when he came on power in 2009, he came with. Uh, public trust of more than 70%. Uh, that is why this past uh, was not uh, problematic for majority of the people 10 or 11 years ago. And he managed to become uh, the prime minister who rules the country for a longer period since, uh, since the transition after the communist uh, period. Okay. 
Uh, Veronica, let me ask you, you this. Why do you think um, the Bulgarian people trusted him for so long when he had such a distasteful past? As you were giving the quote, I couldn't help but remember what Claude Juncker said about him when he called him his golden boy. Uh, so he has been a friend to many people and the European People's Party including. So he has indeed been quite helpful for um, many politicians in, in Europe and he might very well continue to be. So coming back to your question um, about whether you prefer to have it as a friend or a foe, he is definitely a good bodyguard for a lot of us. In, yeah, well, uh, indeed, he was a bodyguard, was he, was he not? Um, I, should yeah. mention, I should mention that after that list of um, insults, if you like, or adjectives from the, the two US envoys, um, he actually got himself voted as the best Bulgarian footballer of the year in 2011, actually beating Manchester United's Dimitar uh, Berbatov to, to the top place. Reminded me a little bit of Donald Trump and, and his golfing. Um, exploits or exaggerations. He, he is um, somebody who was voted into high office, Spasimir, um, and, well, and, uh, but, but now, but now is regarded with distaste by a current generation of politicians. Is it the case that he was able to re retain what he did and stay in power for so long because Bulgarians sort of came to accept corruption as part and parcel of the political process? Well, you know, uh, Borisov is, in practical terms, uh, the emanation of uh, Bulgarian's reality over the last 30 years. Uh, his, uh, his life experience is actually what the country went through, uh, from a complete uh, anarchy and disorder into uh, a state capture in which uh, the, the state mechanisms were uh, absolutely um, uh, taken over uh, by uh, Borisov and the people around him, uh, the, the circles which connect uh, uh, politics and economy, and in practical terms uh, put the country uh, in this uh, extremely inconvenient place among uh, the uh, European Union nations, uh, being the, the poorest and with the most uh, uh, difficult problems. And the paradox of Borisov is because it appeared uh, as an argument already in our discussion that he has uh, friends in the EPL and he's acknowledged in uh, the European Union is that on, on one hand, he is the European face of Bulgaria. Uh, and on the other hand, he is the person who claims to fight corruption while actually takes an enormous advantage of it. So are you suggesting that the Bulgarian people saw him as one of their own because he was a street edge and who became a street fighter, described as a, an, a thug in an Armani suit, who they thought might give them a, a golden future when, in fact, he took it just for himself and his cronies? Yeah, that's a very, I would say, democratic type of explanation, which claims that this is one of us. But I would argue that... Uh, uh, his uh, political career is a little bit uh, overestimated. And uh, I, I, I don't think uh, that the fact that he climbed uh, up uh, uh, so high and for so long uh, was just because the majority of people supported him. Uh, I think that, um, uh, that he was uh, selected to be the one uh, who is able to, in practical terms, uh, um, well, unite uh, uh, the country uh, in a way that uh, it has the face today of, of a captured state. And this is what the people protest against over uh, the last uh, um, already almost two years uh, and the high expectations which um, uh, come with the elections that are forthcoming uh, and equally, uh, next Sunday. Equally, Genoveva, coming, coming back to you, he was the man who managed to get a massive amount of European Union funds, which the Bulgarian people thought were destined for them, although they may have gone elsewhere into different bank accounts, even out of the country and to people in, in high office. That's one reason why they trusted him, yeah? The people trusted him for many reasons and for many years before uh, he became a prime minister. Uh, we must remember that uh, years ago, before the period of his... Uh, Prime Minister period. He was uh, Chief Secretary of the Internal Ministry. He was uh, fighting the crime and so on. 
And if I have to come back to your question regarding the, the EU funds, uh, actually he was the prime minister who managed to convince the European Union and, Union and the other EU member states that uh, his government and his party is capable to to manage these funds. But what I'm saying now is that... Um, come in again in a minute, if you, if you don't mind, Genoveva, but I'll go to you, Angel, yeah. just in the interest of uh, keeping everybody interested in, in the programme. Yes, he got this money, but the Bulgarian people didn't see all of it, or possibly didn't see all of it, because there are now massive accusations of embezzlement, of siphoning off European funds, of the kind of corruption that people have um, said they don't want when they voted him out of office. Bulgaria, like other countries in the region, have a problem with absorption of European funds. This is due, of course, a lot to uh, European bureaucracy and the difficulties of many people in the administration to absorb these funds and use them for uh, projects that could improve uh, the, the quality of life at national and local level. But it's also because of corruption. So corruption is a massive issue throughout the region, both in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Poland, in Hungary. Coming back to Bulgaria, this is one of the countries that has these problems with corruption and uh, discrete distribution of funds uh, to self -servant, um, for self-serving interests uh, by political parties uh, more widely. And it is one of the reasons uh, that this has been strictly connected to security in the region and why it has brought the attention of the U.S. Uh, recently by introducing very targeted sanctions against people who are perceived as being um, very close to power enough to both uh, acquire massive wealth, but also to influence uh, decision making in government. And uh, this is actually something that is going on um, at the moment and that it's influencing the conversation also for the elections that are upcoming in, in a few days. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that little indication, because while we've been examining Borisov's character and that of the people around him. I, I was leading up to the elections which are coming. Well, for that very reason, because we're leading up to the elections and where they might go, I want to bring in something that Laura Covesi said. She's the European public prosecutor. We will investigate all those who commit crimes that falls under our jurisdiction, because we have to prove that the law is equal for everybody. And this means that, yes, we will investigate also powerful people. Yes, we will investigate rich people. Yes, we will investigate dangerous people. But we need to act independently and to prove that the law is equal for everybody. So, Genoveva, what we have here is somebody saying, yes, we will take on the corrupt uh, we have a caretaker government that's setting up a, a commission to investigate what, what's going on. Do you hold out much hope for that? Well, the people have uh, many, many hopes uh, uh, for, for that. Uh, they, they actually expected uh, this uh, for a long time. And uh, it is needed, uh, actually, to to have such a, to have such a investigations uh, uh, on the way the previous government uh, practiced in power. The problem here and the challenge here is that for these two months, uh, of course, two months are still short period, but for these two months, the activity of caretaker government looks a bit like a part of the pre-election campaign. And that is why for many people, especially people who tend to support GERB... Uh, that that being Borisov's that, party. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, they, they think that uh, this activity of the caretaker government is not uh, really something that will uh, help Bulgaria and Bulgarian politics to achieve these uh, needed changes. But Sime, you hold, do you hold the same view, or are you more optimistic? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm more optimistic. I have the feeling that I'm a little bit more pessimistic. Uh, you started asking about um, Borisov and uh, 
we 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 reached the point where we described him also as a, a person that was um, uh, taking care of the of well uh, handling the question of organized crime and uh, a kind of a, a source of inspiration for the uh, state uh, stability. But I have to admit that he more reminds me of a firefighter that uh, sets up fires and. He himself also is a firefighter. Uh, and in that respect, what was happening, uh, especially during Borisov's uh, rule and the mechanisms that were being established, um, uh, uh, led to a situation in which, in practical terms in Bulgaria, everyone knows how the system functions. I mean, it is not a surprise uh, where the EU funds are going, which companies are connected with whom, um, how the money are uh, siphoned from the um, uh, states to the private pockets, and who are the beneficiaries and who are not. Uh, and in that respect, I, uh, I think I profoundly uh, uh, disagree uh, with the argument uh, that the caretaker government is uh, uh, participating in the campaign because in, in, in practical terms this is the first moment and indeed it is a remarkable change because we have to admit that Bulgaria has a long experience of caretaker governments over the last 30 years. This is as far as I counted them, I think it is the fifth one uh, and usually they were indeed a very uh, playing a very technical role. Uh, what has changed profoundly now is that these, go that these governments uh, uh, followed uh, mm, two uh, strands uh, that started dominating um, on the Bulgarian street. This is the protest uh, and the president's office. And indeed, mm, there are people, I mean, the, the caretaker government was nominated by the president, but uh, mm, apart from taking uh, playing a technical role, it also takes advantage of the, possi of the possibility to look uh, in, the, in the particular ministries and to see how they were being uh, managed over the last uh, yes. um, uh, years. You, you, and you what mentioned, comes out... sorry to interrupt, but you mentioned the president's office, and everywhere you turn, there seemed to be an accusation against one institution or another. And I'm thinking about the very complicated story of some photographs that emerged of Borisov. Um, apparently naked, lying in his bedroom with a gun on his bedside cabinet, a, a, a drawer stuffed with 500 euro notes and, and gold bars. And he accused the president of sending up a drone to get these pictures of him to discredit him. Now, I'm wondering whether, in fact, you can trust anybody in the Bulgarian political elite or whether, in fact, the populace are just being asked to say, we don't like this man, we're going to have another one, we'll just see what that's like. I'm very much afraid that there is a logic that uh, the, e the evil we know is better than the evil that we don't know. But on the other hand, there comes a, a, a moment when you just simply uh, have to say that's enough. And I think that uh, uh, what, uh, what was the, the, the reality in Bulgaria over the last uh, 12 years um, is something that uh, uh, simply reached its climax. So it's not the pictures. It's... Uh, it's the reality mm. that uh, was still pushing people to leave the country, uh, uh, the lack of any chances to see uh, a substantial improvement, the building of highways which have to be immediately uh, um, uh, redone again because of the uh, money siphoning and the, and, and the poor um, uh, uh, management of European uh, Union funds. Uh, the fact that... Uh, uh, well, peop people simply uh, have enough of Boris. OK, Sudan. OK. Uh, Veronica, you mentioned at the beginning of the programme how Jean-Claude Juncker had once described Borisov as, as a golden boy, which led me to thinking, how far do you think his connections within the establishment, not just in Bulgaria, but also outside it in the European EU establishment go? How much control might he continue to have uh, if he doesn't succeed once again in becoming prime minister? The important control, um, or let's say connections, um, are under the umbrella of the European People's Party. And the, uh, in, within uh, this, this club, um, every, every partner, every member um, is perceived as an equal. You can just uh, think how difficult it was uh, to have a, a united position when it came to uh, rule of law, um, breaches um, in Hungary uh, by Fidesz. And the, um, the, the, the way in which Boyko Borisov and his party, GERB, have managed to connect to the European People's Party has been 
on much less conflictual terms, or perhaps not even but, but, at but, all. But let's be honest about this. The European Union has also turned a blind eye to the suggestion of the rule of law. Uh, we're talking about Bulgaria, other countries too, but it, it, it seemed not to sort of take too much notice of it. Well, that has changed a bit lately, uh, but it is too little too late. Um, I suppose that you are referring to the uh, rule of law report that was launched in 2020 amid discussions of authoritarian innovations in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and mostly in the countries that are new members of the EU. But it would be wise not to project um, uh, this on this monitoring mechanisms unrealistic expectations. Uh, because the rule of law uh, has always been um, some, I mean, it has some aspect of originality, uh, mainly because it's explicitly monitoring breaches of democratic balance in EU member states, yeah. and it's reliant on multiple sources, including independent sources, uh, but its functions are not particularly novel. So you are quite right to say that, uh, that there has been um, a blind eye turned um, uh, to these countries, uh, because there are many mechanisms that can keep these countries accountable. Um, and uh, it, there hasn't been a clear connection between breaches of rule of law and uh, the EU budget, right? So the funding that we can keep talking about that it's not being traced properly or that it's not going in the right places. Um, and um, indeed, that is something that we can call um, a, a problem that is both sided. So the EU... Yeah is definitely being complacent um, about the, well, the breaches. Perhaps and what for its own interest. I, I, I'm led to ask you, Genoveva, that um, if a new government is returned, if the people of Bulgaria effectively uh, reject the idea of con corruption uh, continuing, do you think the country will be able to sort of get itself up off the bottom of the ladder when it comes to EU prosperity? Will there be uh, convictions of those who've stolen money from the Bulgarian people? even though they may have taken it from the European Union, effectively it's from the Bulgarian people. Will the country be able to clean itself up? Well, it could be possible, of course, uh, because uh, all the people all the people hope that uh, this will be the, the beginning of a new, uh, new era. Uh, but uh, the elections is... Uh, just the beginning or could be just the first step in this direction because as we already discussed uh, the problem with the corruption is uh, not a problem which could be could be solved just with just with changing uh, one face with another face uh, because all these deep connections between the political establishment and uh, business circles uh, could not be broken with uh, only with the change change of people because uh, these uh, connections are quite deep and uh, the dependence between the political uh, representatives and these business circles are quite strong okay. and not at la not lastly the judiciary system is not effective enough to to break that. So I'm sorry and to interrupt. Here, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt, but we, we only have about a minute and a half left, and I, I just want to bring in Spicimia at the very end. Um, if what Genoveva says transpires and we, we we get a coalition government in, it tries to clean up corruption. A, how will we first of all be able to notice that Bulgaria is on a different path? And if that isn't the case, how will the street protests that we're seeing at the moment uh, develop? Do you think they will continue to try to make changes at the ballot box or perhaps elsewhere? We are at the turning point. I think that um, what is happening over the last um, uh, three months is a turning point in Bulgaria's history. I would say that this is another peaceful revolution. And uh, the protest parties have a, um, a relatively clear view of uh, how the changes need to be introduced. Uh, uh, Democratic Bulgaria, one of the opposition parties, talks about constitutional changes. Um, there are some ideas about uh, profound systemic changes when it comes to uh, voting. And all these elements are necessary uh, because, um, as I said, I mean, uh, Bulgarians are very well aware uh, of the situation. This is not something that suddenly 
uh, appears, but this is uh, a, a moment uh, that was um, slowly uh, growing to the point of a climax that we are observing now. And the fact that there was no possibility to create a coalition government three months ago uh, is a very clear example how the red lines are drawn. My only concern is uh, whether the opposition parties, the, the protest parties, will be able indeed to create um, uh, a government uh, um, after the uh, after the well, we shall just have to we shall just have to it's... wait and see, Spasimir. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Uh, we will wait to see what the the results of the election and what follows, and we will take it up here again on Roundtable on TRT World. Genoveva, thank you very much indeed for joining us. My apologies if you felt you were interrupted rudely by me. I'm only trying to move the argument on and to some kind of conclusion. And Veronica, much appreciated from your holidays in Sicily, hence the poor connection, but we appreciate you taking the time to join us. To all three of you, our thanks, and to you, wherever you happen to be watching. Uh, this edition of Roundtable, our sincere thanks to you. Uh, we hope you can join us on another occasion. Until then, from me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, goodbye.